Welcome everybody to the Equity Guru interview series. I'm Chris Parry, uh, your faithful uh, director of the show. With me, I've got Hugh Rogers from X Phyto. Um, X Phyto is a company that has gone through, I would say, a metamorphosis or an evolution might be might be the better way of doing it over the last few years. Um, back in the day, there was a, a strong cannabis focus. That focus has, has shifted a few times into areas that I guess are uh, uh, sideways m more than than pivots. But how would you describe the company today here? Well, I think that's fair in terms of an evolution, and we I, I think we've evolved into a, uh, a technology incubator. So we still participate in the cannabis industry, um, but purely on the medical side and focus more on drug delivery. So we do have uh, several candidates um, in clinical trials this year um, in Europe that are cannabinoid based. Uh, but these are uh, generic and hybrid generic formulas. So competitors to approve, these are prescription uh, medications. Uh, we're also in the diagnostic space uh, and in psychedelic space. And there's, you know, there's some the rhyme and reason for that uh, behind the scenes and in terms of the licenses that we held in, in Canada, and the flexibility and opportunities in cannabis overlap with psychedelics because of our relationship with the University of Alberta. Um, and uh, one of our directors who had licenses for both cannabis and psychedelics. And then in the diagnostic space, there was overlap between the opportunity in Germany uh, with diagnostics and with our drug delivery company in Germany. So the diagnostics company is using some of the drug delivery technology for its biosensors. Um, so there's overlap between these different areas, although on its surface, they do seem to be sort of wildly different, but there is some, uh, some strategy there. And, yeah, I always figured that the, the, the true categorization of cannabis opportunities was as a pharmaceutical uh, company or even biotech. Um, same with psychedelics. And obviously, you've got the, you're touching on COVID at the moment falls into that same category. Is, is that how you see yourself? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, this is the, the COVID opportunity was really was a secondary opportunity to our initial foray into diagnostics. Uh, the initial opportunity was focused on, uh, although it was in the infectious disease space, it was, uh, as I said, a thin film delivery of biosensors. Then uh, COVID was foisted upon us on the planet and the company, our exclusive partner, 3A Diagnostics, had technology for a new, um, a rapid point of care COVID PCR test. So we jumped on that opportunity um, it's been commercialized very recently um, and now just starting um, commercial sales in Europe. So that's very good. There was obviously a point where, you know, a lot of companies were trying to find a way to touch COVID uh, as, a, as a market opportunity. Um, you know, obviously with the prevalence of vaccines, there's probably a, a, a negative swing on COVID right now that it's a, a problem that might be close to being taken care of. It, it, does there remain a bit a strong business opportunity on that front for you uh, if the world you know gets its jabs? Absolutely. So I, I think you you made a good point. It's not as sensational as it once was as a business opportunity, but the fundamentals are there. So and I think this is especially especially true in Europe, where you've got many more borders, uh, much more porous borders. Uh, so we, let's talk about Europe and the Middle East in particular. Um, take a country like Dubai, where you've got a tremendous amount of tourism um, and transient um, residents, as well as let's say their their convention business. As an example, um, it, there there is a there's a critical need for testing. This will be ongoing, um, not just to it'll be monitoring the success of vaccines is one, um, but at these let's say points of contact where you have movement between the developed and the developing world, which is particularly true in parts of Europe and the Middle East, um, we will need testing and it's going to have to be rapid. It's going to have to be accurate. It will have to be PCR. Um, and if you do it at point of care, um, that's ideal. So I think we're particularly well suited for you know, the airline industries, cruise ships, um, and any of these sort of border control areas in particularly sensitive uh, what needs regions. to happen for you, for you to be able to scale that business to a point where it's a, a, a large scale global enterprise? 
we have to capture actually very little of sort of the, the larger testing industry to be a significant business. You know, for us, there is a, from the point of, let's say, CE mark validation this spring to where we are today, there's been an education process because we are PCR, but we're, we're different. So there, there's a shift in the way that we um, essentially utilize this test. Conventional PCR testing would be batch collection of samples sent to a centralized lab. We are, um, we're designed for point of care testing. So that at the place, let's say it's a pharmacy, a doctor's office, an airport, Wherever they collect the sample, they process it on site. Okay. And, and this is really important in terms of the economics because as the COVID, as COVID numbers decrease, the economic viability of high throughput centralized labs goes down because they will either have to run at a loss because the, they're batching like, let's say a thousand samples at once. But if they only have 50, they either have to run the 50 samples at a loss or wait until they have, let's say, 500 samples. Got so it. the testing reporting time becomes longer or it's uneconomic, whereas we can run at much lower, let's say, low to moderate throughput and still make money. So, uh, for example, my kids are heading back to school and we're hearing that the Delta variant is, is, makes kids more susceptible. Uh, we could be doing tests at the school door. Uh, before the kids go in in the morning rather than having to test everyone and wait a week for it to come back. Yeah, that's right. And, and probably what they'll do is something like, uh, and we're in discussions in Germany with, for, for exactly this, um, this use case. Uh, as an example, they might do screening for illness, let's say temperature screening at the door for all students. If you're flagged with a temperature, then you go and do a rapid PCR. Got it. So that would be an example. So you're not trying to screen a thousand children, but you might screen 50 a day, something like that, 5% of them. And obviously that, that then lends itself to, you know, the next coronavirus that hits us or, or, or something similar. That's right. So we do have a platform technology, um, you know, whether it's Corona or H1N1 or H5N1, um, it, it's, it's quite adaptable and versatile. And that's, uh, that's something, you know, one of the reasons we found it so attractive. Got it. So let's, let's shift along to uh, the psychedelic side of things. Now, I, I, I feel like any cannabis company that's not also looking at psychedelics <laughs> is really doing itself a disservice because they are two sides of the same coin, as, as I understand it. Um, you know, medical uses that require much of the same licensing to get to um and uh you know the only variation is the origin plant um how, how are you seeing that that industry evolving i think that's true and we're taking a similar approach i think the cannabis industry you know obviously especially in north america went recreate you know took a hard turn towards recreational uh use i think psychedelics you know may eventually get there in some form but it's not going to be such a let's say such a hard turn i think we see similar opportunities uh, in psychedelics. I think uh, there's fewer, let's say, I think there'll be fewer players in the psychedelic space. Um, I, I do. Real players, maybe. R real players. I think, you know, I see a lot of public companies who make an announcement that they're going into psychedelics, but when you read their financial statements, they have no licenses. They have no agreements with groups that have licenses, no <laughs> agreements with universities. I'm not sure how they're in the psychedelic space right. other than having made a press release. Um, whereas, you know, we have uh, the director of our company and, and the major shareholder is the founder of the Drug Development Center at the University of Alberta. He had one of the first cannabis licenses in Canada. Um, he had one of the first psychedelic licenses in Canada. Um, he's an expert in nano drug delivery. He's the former president of the Canadian Pharmacy Association. Uh, he's leading our psychedelic program. Um, we're, as you probably know, uh, synthesizing mescaline right now. Um, we think mescaline holds particular promise for a number of indications. Um, we find it very attractive because there isn't a lot of competition in mescaline, mm. uh, notwithstanding uh, certain properties it appears to have. It, 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 we think it's limited in use because um, cactus or cacti are not easy to scale. So cultivation of cactus is not easy. Um, so therefore, uh, access to the actual compound, um, it, it can be more complicated than say psilocybin. Um, 
So are you looking to, to synthesize the mescaline or are you? Yeah, so we are synthesizing right now. So we have, uh, we've completed synthesis. We're in purification and scaling up. Um, manufacturer, uh, we're developing the SOPs for GMP production and expect by end of quarter to have uh, GMP uh, mescaline production. So, so I usually like, you know, when I'm talking to, uh, to people in the business that are trying to get a detention of investors, my first question is what makes you different from the other 200 guys at a Cambridge house conference with the same backdrop? Um, if you're looking to differentiate yourself in the psychedelic space, going towards masculine instead of buying a mushroom farm in Langley, uh, is a great differentiator, a great way to sort of say, this is our vertical. Anyone who wants to come into there has got to compete with us in a, in a way that might be difficult. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And if you look at, there's, if you, if you can Google uh, registered clinical trials, just Google that, you'll see how many are registered for psilocybin, 150 plus globally. It's probably more now since I last looked. There's less than five for mescaline. So, and, and I think the reason is access to the actual cacti. So because we've taken a, a more sort of modern uh chemical engineering approach, we have an abundant, we have as much supply as we want. We also own, because of our drug delivery company in Germany, we have uh, oral drug delivery systems, also a platform. So the step from, you know, securing supply and not just supply, but this is, you know, GMP pharmaceutical grade supply, plus our proven drug delivery system, you know, the next step, so that's step one, step two, step three is clinical validation. So that's where this is going. Um, and the clinical validation will be in North America. I ran some psilocybin trials at the cabin on the weekend and I can see <laughs> very therapeutic. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess the psychedelics has the same issue that, that COVID uh, has as a, as a investment category. And this obviously the same issue that cannabis has right now in that a lot of people who were previously fans or maybe chasing the big rise have soured a little bit and are, are looking to, you know, Dogecoin or whatever else they can find that might be on a rip this weekend. I'm guessing that you're looking at all three of these categories as a much longer term strategy, but also uh, as as elements of the same single thread, which is finding a way to get uh, interesting therapeutics into the mouths of, of, of potential patients. Um, and if your research in cannabis lends itself to psychedelics, and your drug delivery system lends itself to COVID. Um, it, it's not, you're not so much, you know, the old companies that where people say you're doing too much, and you're not able to focus on all things at once. You're doing all the things that lead into the one business element. Yeah, I think that's true. And we, you know, our approach to psychedelics, for example, was not to go and buy a mushroom farm, as you mentioned, it was, you know, for a relatively low cost, you know, for hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions or tens of millions, to develop a psychedelic drug program. And we've done that very successfully to date. Um, you know, our drug delivery programs in, in Germany, we have four trials planned for this year. Again, you know, hundreds of thousands, not millions. These are scalable opportunities. So our psychedelic business fits in, you know, it's related to our cannabis business, but it also fits in to our, our overall drug, drug delivery and drug development programs. And our diagnostic business um, shares overlaps with, as I mentioned, with a drug delivery, but it's also our COVID test is one of many products in our diagnostics pipeline. So some of those are in, let's say, pandemic related. Um, you know, we have German government funding for development of avian flu and swine flu biosensors. But we also have programs. Uh, our, our next product to market will be uh, for periimplantitis, which is not a sexy indication. It's an infection of dental implants, but it's a very important indication because it'll, it's an early warning system to allow uh, a dentist or physician to identify an infection that would otherwise lead to significant uh, tissue damage. So that means removal of the implant, and in most cases, it cannot be replaced because of the tissue damage. So, you know, it is, it's again, it's not sexy. Nobody's going to go crazy about dental implant infections, but if you have a low cost biosensor, um, that can identify this early on, this is an important medical uh, product. And we think there's, a, you know, for us, there's an enormous margin. It will be delivered via our drug delivery system, our oral dissolvable system. So that's the overlap, uh, the tie-in with X Phyto. Um, and that's the reason we did that deal. So if I look at your website today, 
uh, it's very different from what it was a couple of years ago. Is there a, you know, as much as there's an opportunity in the cannabis space, is there a, a corporate thinking to lay off the cannabis uh, branding for a bit uh, to maybe ease through other elements of your business plan that, that, that people might look at cannabis and say, oh, they're just a cannabis company and they're not serious. Uh, is, uh, you, I know you've gone through a rebranding, but was that part of the thinking? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And then what we found was in Europe, particularly institutional investors, uh, many of them uh, would uh, shy away from cannabis, any, anything cannabis related. And it took, you know, it would take a few conversations to explain to them that we only participate in medical cannabis opportunities um, and only in Europe. So, you know, these are regulated clinical trials uh, for medical products that will be prescription uh, based. So it, it's just, I think we need to, we really wanted to highlight uh, the scientific and medical approach that we were taking. Um, it was, you know, not just a, so certainly to differentiate ourselves from anything recreational. Got it. That, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I, I think that, uh, you know, much to what I was saying earlier, where I think cannabis and psychedelics and, and uh, COVID uh, all sort of relate to the same real industry. They, they, they may be subsectors within that sector, but it's all pharmaceuticals at, at that point. And whether or not, you know, I think if you were selling strawberry milkshakes, but you're advertising it as having flavoring derived from crushing a Brazilian beetle, uh, people would be less inclined to, to go and have a milkshake but it's the end product that's the important thing it's not the elements that go into it yeah i agree i mean we're, we are in the medical industry we're producing medical products uh, we have a number in clinical trials we have uh, one in the market now to be followed by many more so it's so let's talk about the stock uh as it stands obviously you know you like going into the summer with a an upward move uh, currently, ex Fido stock is is rolling around on the lows. Uh, what do you contribute that to? Well, I think you know some of it is probably uh, maybe a misunderstanding of where we fit in the uh, COVID testing world, and I think um, that's part of it. I think people are also waiting for news in terms of sales, uh, which is you know and rightly so so we are very close now uh, on the cusp of a number of significant transactions uh, in europe and the middle east uh, we expect to announce those uh, hopefully within the next month or so uh, certainly into the fall um, and i think you know structurally we're also looking at a significant warrant overhang uh, to be perfectly frank so uh, we have a number of What's, what price are those warrants uh 70 cents and a dollar 20. Okay, so uh, that's a significant shift, even from 166. Uh, that's a, a nice profit. I can understand people selling up to execute. Yeah, so we don't see really much selling other than people going to cash to exercise their warrants and certainly not exiting their positions. Um, right. But, you know, it's, it's the middle of the summer and, um, you know, on moderate volume, that can have a significant impact. I think once that pressure is off, we're going to see a turnaround um, and couple that with, uh, positive news in terms of sales. I think we're, you know, going into the fall, things look a lot more positive. So, you know, and, and I guess the cash influx as well from those warrants is, is going to be a, a happy thing. So if someone looks at your company right now and sees that it's at a buck 66 instead of the near four bucks that it was a few months back, um, you're cashing up, you've got sales coming, you've got news coming. What, what, I, th what I think is really interesting about X Fido is that you have an ability to break into other areas without having to wholesale, recapitalize, retool, build new facilities, get new licenses. Well, with psychedelics, you already had the licensing, you already had the people. Uh, with COVID, you already had the platform, you already had the people. Uh, those platforms and those licenses lend themselves to a whole bunch of areas that you have not as yet publicly moved to, but the option remains for you if, if suddenly people are uh you know into ayahuasca then you know it's a short step if there's another COVID, it's a short step uh are, are there areas that you're looking at within that framework already or are you kind of on a wait and see well we're certainly looking at other opportunities and this is particularly true in germany because of you know the success we've had in, in terms of you know for example our COVID test it went from invention to prototype to you know regulatory approval in a very short period of time 
um, we've attracted some attention there within the scientific community. So we get new projects sent to us or potential projects on a regular basis. We are reviewing those, but I think for the time being, you know, going back to the COVID, you know, we've taken that from invention to commercialization. Now it's to build a business around that, you know, over the next six to 12 months. And I think as, uh, as we succeed there, we will look to, you know, allocate capital and other, in other areas. I think certainly psychedelics, obviously, um, you know, we've ventured into that sector. Um, we are looking very closely at other opportunities in the psychedelic space. Um, our team at the University of Alberta um, is reviewing, or I should say, well, working on some very exciting opportunities in terms of psychedelic analogs, the chemical engineering side. So these will be patentable, new patentable compounds. Um, based on, let's say, natural psychedelics. Um, so that's very interesting. I mean, that's somewhere where we are allocating capital right now. Um, so you can, people can look for news on that front. Um, and I think, as I said, we, you know, we have an open mind. We have a, a, an extremely talented team in everything from diagnostics to infectious disease to drug delivery. So um, it's all on the table. Let me ask you, what is the... The, the current Canadian licensing allow you to do exactly? Because I, I know a lot of companies that are in the psychedelic space have either they've got a, an Airbnb in Jamaica that they're calling a clinic or they're talking about ketamine because it's legal. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a whole lot of sort of expanding the, the, the concept. Uh, where does that licensing allow you to actually get in and advance things rather than playing around the edges like so many are. So Dr. Lobenberg's license allows us to do to use almost all known psychedelic compounds as well as derivatives and related compounds. Um, in terms of an actual clinical trial, that would still go through Health Canada. But I think, uh, you know, given our team and uh, the partners that we are that, that we're building. So this is a broader network on the clinical trial side. Um, which is very exciting. And we, we will have news on that um, in the coming months. Uh, we don't expect any issue in terms of health Canada approval. Okay. So you've got that leg up on the competition, both in terms of the paperwork and the people to be able to push in deeper than let's say if I started a numbered company tomorrow and wanted to get involved in psychedelics. Absolutely. We've got, you know, world-class drug development, a drug development team. We've got the regulatory team. We've got, um, a very, uh, I would say, influential um, counseling network uh, that will be involved in the clinical trial, uh, and there'll be at least one. So it's uh, it is very exciting, and we don't expect any any uh, roadblocks in that regard. So do you think there's a disconnect between people who've dug in on your your business model and your people, and and have been here for a while? And those that just trade what they see to be a, a, a you know a sector opportunity, it, it, it seems like you've got a good solid base of investors that don't go anywhere. But you've also got a lot of guys that that maybe jump in and out. I think that's true. I think in, in any stock that you know that uh, let's say any business that deals with uh, let's say sensational opportunities or explosive opportunities that are timely and opportunistic, you're going to get ins and outs. There's going to be some fast money, but like you said, you know, we have a very strong base. The majority of our shareholders have been with us for a long time and have reinvested uh, at numerous opportunities in terms of warrant exercises and conversions. Um, so I don't, you know, our average shareholder is, you know, one of the best I've ever seen. So not concerned in that regard, but at the same time, you know, you're completely right. You know, we're in certain industries that um, you know, excitement, it comes and it goes. And, and I think we're, we're broad enough now that people see, well, there's multiple opportunities. If it's not just COVID, it's the next one, it's H1N1, it's the, you know, it's swine flu, it's avian flu. It's, it's, um, we, we have the ability to, to move very quickly, which I think is different, um, than a lot of larger companies. And I think most of us have been through a situation where we've had to get tested or someone that we're not close to had to get tested. And it makes for a, you know, for a 48 hours that's pretty tension filled, uh, if not longer, if it's a weekend. So the, a 25 minute COVID-19 test uh, where you can be sit and have a coffee waiting for the results, uh, that seems to me to be a betterment of the world as it stands. I think so, absolutely. 
Yeah, well, I, look, I think the opportunity here is pretty apparent. You know, uh, you guys have hit all the marks that you set out for yourselves. Um, you've, you've developed uh, technology that you own. You've got p the right people. Uh, you've seen opportunities and gone after them without having to break the, the central tenant of the company up. Uh, and the business model remains what it was in the outset, which is uh, getting better results for medical patients. So, you know, I, I commend what you're doing. Uh, I think that probably your warrants have given people an opportunity to get a good price if they want to buy in on this story. Uh, and I think that's something that I'm going to think about over the next couple of days, because uh, honestly, the, the valuation that's attached to you to be in three different high interest uh, sectors uh, that all tie together with, without having to do three different operational build outs. You know, that makes a, it makes a lot of sense to me. I think you're doing it the right way. Thanks a lot, Chris. I appreciate that. We'll talk again soon. All right. Thank you.